people. I hope we're doing well today. Uh, as promised, these are the Law of Cosines um, videos. Uh, and like I said before, the Law of Cosines, and there's, actual, there's actually also a Law of Tangents. We're not going to cover that one. Um, and I, you know, I may mention it to you at some point. Um, but there's, there's Law of Cotangents, too. I mean, <clears throat> basically... Any, anything that helps us to relate quantities uh, within oblique triangles is kind of helpful, okay? Uh, but uh, basically the whole idea is that law of signs helps us to solve oblique triangles when we can actually get a complete ratio, okay? Well, if we can't get a complete ratio, like the example here, and of course the example uh, in the class discussion, uh, I have three sides. I have side, side, side. There's nothing that I can do that's going to get me uh, another angle. And I, there's nothing that I can do that's going to get me a complete ratio. I have three denominators and I can't set up a proper proportion. And therefore, I need to make recourse to a, to a different, to something different. Okay. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. And that, of course, is the law of cosines. Okay. Now, the law of cosines is going to allow us. Uh, it's going to allow us to do a lot of a lot of neat things uh, in terms of uh, arriving at solutions for those. Uh, for those quantities when I do not have a complete ratio. Well, that's that's kind of helpful, okay? Especially like in the in the one that we just had. Uh, what I would like to do, uh, and I did this in the in the class discussion as well, is I want to show you where it comes from. Now, I don't expect you when I show you these demonstrations and these derivations and these proofs and stuff like that. Um, I am not expecting you to memorize these, though I have made students memorize them in the past. Uh, my whole goal, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just lay my cards on the table, my whole goal is over the next year uh, to brainwash you. Uh, I want to change the way that you think about mathematics. Uh, and, and I want you to think about math differently. And part of that is showing you the logic behind it. Even if you don't remember the details, the impression that you gain from understanding from these demonstrations will enrich your understanding of what it is that math is about. Uh, what it means to think mathematically, and that's kind of the goal that I have. So, you know, if you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to fast forward right now, and some of you probably already have. Um, if you're saying, I'm going to fast forward right now because I don't want to listen to this, it's not going to be on the quiz, uh, shame on you, first of all. <laughs> and, and second of all, you're kind of missing the point, okay? The point, first of all, and you should know this better than the kids down the street at the local public high school, the point is the learning, all right? The point is not the grades. Uh, and if the point is the learning, then you should be happy to learn a ton of things that are never gonna be on the quiz. Uh, and Because basically, it, it, I'm trying to teach you how to think mathematically the grading, the assessments, and stuff like that is a necessary evil uh, that is given to us because, you know, parents and colleges and all sorts of fun stuff like that. But I digress. Let's go ahead and get to this. Now, when we are, when we are uh, deriving or demonstrating law of cosines, we're going to drop that altitude again. Uh, and, and largely that's because we are trying to take, uh, we're trying to basically borrow from these two right triangles, which have very obvious trigonometric relationships in them, I'm going to borrow from those and sort of extrapolate out to the oblique triangle that comprises both of those right triangles. Now, uh, let's go ahead and look at A over here. I know that cosine A 
can be seen as x over c. Okay, and that means that c cosine a is equal to x. Okay, and if you're wondering why, then just hold, hold your, you know, cool your jets and hold on for a second. Uh, from that same relationship, we can tell that x plus x squared plus h squared is equal to c squared. Now, we also see a third relationship, and that third relationship is b minus x squared plus h squared is equal to a squared. Now the first two come from this right triangle here on the left. One is a trigonometric ratio in terms of cosine. The other one is simply the Pythagorean theorem of the left side. This one, of course, is the Pythagorean theorem of the right hand right triangle, the one over here, leg, leg, hypotenuse, right? <clears throat> now, I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this out a little bit, and you need to remember that b minus x squared and x minus b squared really the same thing, right? Because when you square a difference, you can reverse the difference uh, if you factor out a negative, but that negative then winds up being squared as well, so it really doesn't matter. Now I could reverse this and think about it as x minus b squared, but I'm not going to, and it'll become obvious why here in just a minute. Uh, because I'm gonna be doing a little bit of substitution, okay? Now what happens is I recognize that I have a wonderful expression, I have a wonderful equation that relates all of the quantities in that, in that thing, except for C. C is not in this one right here. But I need to figure out a way to construct a, uh, an equation, a formula, that does not rely on those variables that I artificially introduced meaning x and h. x and h were not part of the original triangle, uh, so I would like to get to a point where I have a necessary relationship between the parts of the triangle themselves without having to deal with externally and artificially imported variables. And what that means is I need to figure out a way to get rid of the x's and the h. And the best way to do that is simply by substitution. And that, of course, is why I have this c squared. c squared is equal to x squared plus h squared, so that can be substituted right in there. And this x right here, I can take this c cosine a, and I can drop it in right there. And what happens, and I'm going to turn this around and put the a squared over here on the left-hand side, I'm going to get b squared, and of course the c squared, plus c squared minus 2bc cosine of a. And that is our formula. That's it. Uh, so it actually doesn't take too much. It just takes getting the right three relationships, one to expand out and the other two to use to import in basically by substitution. Now. Some of you are thinking, hey, wait a minute, that's really neat, but I know that if you have an obtuse triangle, you have to drop that altitude outside, okay? So how is that gonna work? I'm so glad you asked. Let's discuss it. And you're right, that if you are dealing with an obtuse triangle, you have to drop the altitude out here. Okay. Now, of course, I mean, you can turn it around like that, but then it's not the same way, and you can drop the altitude inside. But let's just go ahead and progress from here because uh, we need to be able to sort of replicate the, we need to be able to replicate the, the formula, the law of cosines formula, no matter, how, no matter what the orientation is. Now, I'm going to label these the same way that they were labeled before. This is my angle A. This is my angle C. This up here is my angle B. This is side A. This is side C. And the base is B, which is kind of nice. Now, what we have introduced is we've introduced X. We've also introduced H. And we've also introduced this other angle right here. This other angle is 180 minus A because that's 180 degrees minus A. 
Okay. Well, let's see. Let's see what happens when we set up those relationships again. Okay. Because I still see two right triangles, but it's no longer two right triangles, both of which are embedded within the oblique triangle. They have been created by adding this piece on here. One right triangle is what we just added and using C as a hypotenuse. The other is the entire thing. So let's go ahead and let's look at, uh, first of all, let's go ahead and put, uh, we have X squared plus H squared is equal to C squared. Wow, that's still there. Okay, well let's go ahead and let's also look at the cosine relationship. But the cosine relationship is not going to be with respect to A because A is not an angle within a right triangle. But we can do it with respect to 180 degrees minus A because that right there is an angle that is within a right triangle and its cosine is X over C. So x is equal to c times cosine of 180 minus a. And if you just think about it in terms of, if you just think about it in terms of transformations, uh, cosine of 180 minus a, that's cosine of negative a minus 180, right? Okay, well the negative doesn't matter. So basically cosine of 180 minus A is the same as cosine of A minus 180, which of course in terms of radians is just pi. What happens when you shift cosine uh, to the right pi? Well, you shift it half of its period and it looks as if it has been, uh, it looks as if it has been uh, reflected across the x-axis. And if you were to actually uh, use the difference formula for the difference identity for cosine, you would amount to the same thing. And you get the fact that X is equal to negative C times cosine of A. Okay, again, I'm going to be using these for substitution. And I'm going to go ahead and use Pythagorean theorem for the whole, for the big right triangle. And it's um, B plus x squared plus h squared is equal to a squared. Now, before, in the last version, this was b minus x, Now the, and it was squared. The only difference between b plus x and b minus x is the sign, s-i-g-n, like the positiveness or negativeness, the sign of that middle term. Well, the sign of that middle term is going to be different but so is the expression that we're plugging in. And so instead of the negative being part of this equation, the negative is imported with the substitution. Let's see what happens here. Uh, let's go ahead and put the a squared over here on the left-hand side, and I'm gonna get b squared plus 2bx plus x squared plus h squared. Now, Again, this right here comes in for this. This right here comes in for this x. And after just a little bit of reordering, you still get b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine of a. And that is identical to what it was on the previous sheet, okay? And what we get is if we were to you know, turn the, turn the triangle and do the same thing with a base of A and then with a base of C, we would wind up getting all three of these. Uh, now, this is uh, what comes from Ron Larson's uh, pre-calculus textbook. I sort of just screenshot it so I could plop it in here. These are the alternative forms and they amount to nothing more than basically taking this one and solving for cosine A, taking this one and solving for cosine B, taking this one and solving for cosine C. Well, you ought to be able to add and subtract and divide and solve for an expression or a variable that is embedded within a larger equation. That should not be difficult. What's more difficult than that is memorizing a second form of all three of these. So I would just go ahead and just concentrate on that. Now, one thing that I do want you to take notice of is 
that when you look at the law of cosines, it looks really, really intimidating. But when you cover it up like this, it looks like the Pythagorean theorem, right? And indeed, you just saw the fact that when I was deriving it, I was substituting into an equation that, ha that was basically the Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theorem uh, equation expanded and then substituted in. So really what you're doing is you're taking, uh, you're taking, you're basically saying, okay, it's not a right triangle, but it's, you know, but it's still a triangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to, and this is sort of like just loosely what you're doing. You're kind of saying, okay, let's do the Pythagorean theorem and then adjust it. And basically your minus 2bc cosine a or your minus 2ac cosine b or your minus 2ab cosine c is basically adjusting the Pythagorean theorem to where it's to where you've basically made it true with this with this caveat for oblique triangles. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, that always that always helped me in order to memorize it, right? It's basically like, okay, it's the, it's just a Pythagorean theorem where you're saying, okay, I'm gonna treat A like it's the hypotenuse, and then we'll list it out, and then the B and the C both wind up there, and then it's cosine A. And that was that was how I always thought of it. But if that doesn't work for you, then don't don't listen to me, okay? Alrighty, let's go ahead and let's work on some of these. Now notice the great thing about the law of cosines, there's there's a bad thing and a good thing. The bad thing, we've already seen it, it's a more complicated formula, but you should be able to memorize it without much problem. That's the bad part. The good part, no ambiguities. No ambiguity. Now there are times when there are where there is no solution, but uh, there is not there's never a time when you're given information and you will use the law of cosines and there will be two possible answers. That's just not gonna happen. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. This one is side, side, side. And uh, so, you know, this is A, this is B, and this is C. And so A is 27, B is 19, and C is 24. Well, it doesn't, doesn't really matter to me which one we go for. A comes first in the alphabet, so let's do that, okay? And so we get A squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine a, which in this case works out to uh, 27 squared is equal to 19 squared plus 24 squared minus 2 times 19 times 24 times cosine of a. And this is gonna be one of those times when you need to solve for cosine A. But all you have, I mean, and the thing is that you ought to be able to do this in your head. You know that, you know that the 19 squared is coming over, you know that the 24 squared is coming over, and then you know that after you do that, what's left is this as a coefficient sitting in front of cosine A. <clears throat> and so instead of, instead of memorizing that alternative form, just do the just do the simple solving for the trigonometric expression. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and multiply by a negative over a negative because that's going to wind up, you know, being a little bit easier and leaving. I was always the guy who made my careless errors uh, with uh, with negatives. I would either lose the negative or you know you know whatever. But basically, that was where I always got uh, my points taken off. So I have, over the years, basically <laughs> created uh, little tricks to where I don't wind up uh, little tricks so that I don't have to I don't have to remember the negatives. It just sort of takes care of itself, right? Now this winds up simplifying rather nicely to 13 over 57. Again, emphasizing that because um, because we just we don't want to be dealing with approximate answers and then accidentally using those approximate answers instead of the actual value. Uh, on top of the fact that I just like fractions better. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the arc cosine of that value. 
And what we get is we get 76.817. 76.817. Now, I am going to approximate that down here, always to three decimal places. But when I do my calculator work, I'm going to use the actual value. And like I've said before, you may just want to store it in as the letter so that you don't have to, you know, you know, so you don't have to arrow up in order to like capture it and bring it down for your equation. Now that I actually have one angle, I now have a complete ratio. And as long as I'm using the exact value, I'll be fine. So what I want to do now is I want to look for angle B. So let's look for sine of B over 19 is equal to sine of A, which is 76.817 degrees, uh, or approximately that, over 27 and therefore B is the arc sine of 19 over 27 times sine of 76,817 degrees. Now, if that's the case, uh, then I simply just need to do arc sine, okay? And we can go ahead and put in a fraction right here. It's gonna be 19 over 27 times uh, sine. Now remember, I took that value and I stored it into A, so I can just put A there, and boom. What I get is I get a B value of 43.248 degrees. Now all I need is subtraction, because C should be 180 degrees minus A minus B, and so I get 180 degrees minus, and I'll go B first since it's right there, minus A, and I wind up getting 59.935 degrees. Now, <coughs> let's go ahead and see whether that actually makes sense. I notice that my longest side is opposite my largest angle. My shortest side is opposite my smallest angle. Uh, there actually is a formula that you can plug in uh, that has actually all six pieces of the, uh, of the triangle. And I'll, I'll show that to you a little bit later. Um, and basically, if you want to memorize it, that would be a great way to, deter that, to sort of check your answer after you're done. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that here in just, in just a little while. Uh, this will bring us to the end of, of video one. Uh, I'll continue working some problems and we will get to uh, area formula here before long. Uh, I then will, at the end of the last video before we get to the proof of Heron's area formula, uh, I'll deal with uh, the problem from yesterday that I stumbled over. Man, it was a stupid arithmetic mistake. Uh, but when you're, you know, I don't want to sit there for five minutes trying to find it. So I kind of threw it aside and moved on. Uh, and then the problem today where I kind of misunderstood the, or I, I was questioning the context. Uh, that's actually kind of neat because I wanted, there are two different ways to do that problem. And I'll tack those two questions uh, on to the end before we move on to Heron's, uh, to the proof of Heron's error for area formula. So, uh, as always, if you have any questions, please do uh, shoot me a message on Teams and I will try to get back to you. Bye.